Good evening or good afternoon or good morning, everyone, wherever you happen to be in the world. My name's Don Kurtz. I'm a professional astronomer. Um, those of you who are not American have already heard that I have an American accent. I had a Canadian mother, an American father, and I was born and raised in San Diego in California. I went to Texas for my PhD, University of Texas at Austin, and then for an adventure because I like to climb mountains and dive in the sea and walk with the animals. I went to South Africa to Cape Town for a year after I finished my PhD, and I stayed for 24 years. I left the University of Cape Town as a senior professor, went to France to work at the Observatoire Midi Pyrenees for a while, and then I have been now in the United Kingdom, where I am now also a dual citizen, United Kingdom and the United States. I've been here for 19 years now, and I do these trips with the Golden Eagle. In the search of the Northern Lights, I've also done the Trans-Siberian, which I can recommend to you highly. And so you had a look at what I look like. I'm now going to bring up the slideshow, and we will begin the talk. In search of the Aurora Borealis, our trip for this with the Golden Eagle goes to the Arctic. And here's a beautiful picture of the Earth, which has been done with an orbiting satellite that is Earth observation, but it orbits over the poles. So it can't take this picture in just one picture. It's taken many pictures and astronomers spent a great deal of time stitching them together to make a realistic view of the Earth, as you maybe have not seen it before, looking down onto the Arctic, onto the pole. And if you look carefully, you'll see the outline of Greenland here. I think you can see my arrow, which is a cursor. You, those of you who are in the UK, there's the UK here and Ireland and France, the rest of Europe over here. And Russia, there's the North Pole. The part of Russia and Norway that we go to in the train is underneath all this snow and ice. This is a winter adventure. We will be within the Arctic Circle. This is a map view of the Earth with the North Pole at the center. This blue ring is the Arctic Circle, and that's the line where on the northern winter solstice, uh, December the 21st, anywhere north of that line, the sun doesn't rise at all. We'll be going down here, and we'll blow that up just a little bit. We will start either in St. Petersburg or Moscow, depending on which trip you take, and go up between the lakes up to Murmansk, over to Nickel, and then we take a bus over to Kirkenes in Norway for two nights where you'll have a chance to do dog sledding, to go out onto the sea ice and fish for crabs, which you'll have for lunch, to stay in the snow hotel if you're brave enough, but to visit it in any case, and to go out with me in the night north of the Arctic Circle and look for the Northern Lights. Following that, we come back down, and if we started in St. Petersburg, we end up in Moscow. If we start in Moscow, we end up back in St. Petersburg. There's your train in the wintertime. You will have a Provodnitsa and a Provodnik, two carriage attendants, who will greet you always as you're getting on the train, and they'll take care of you 24 hours a day for whatever you might need. Um, you'll become quite close to your Provodnitsa and Provodnik on the blue train, the, the Golden Eagle. It can be cold. That, there's my wife and me at the Snow Hotel having a toast with a glass made of ice, sitting on a chair made of ice with snow bunnies here in the background. And you'll get a nice tour of that. And some of you will be brave and actually choose to stay there overnight. The temperature in the Snow Hotel is a constant minus five degrees Celsius. If you prefer warmer weather for your toasts, well, of course, if you're on the New Year's trip on the train, there's New Year's Eve on the Golden Eagle with a toast with absolutely top quality champagne, and as you can see, a wonderful dinner. You will meet Russians. There on the left is a young Russian lady who is providing traditional bread and salt as we enter for a banquet in a hotel in Moscow. On the right is a little girl who just happened to spot me out in public, and I spotted her, and we smiled at each other, and I took her picture. And the men of Russia, well, the one on the left is a busker. He makes his living looking something like Stalin and charging you to take a picture of him. The one on the right who has a very gentle smile is a priest from one of the many beautiful Russian churches that we visit. We will have cultural events. This is a music and dance group in Karelia in Petrozavodsk, and we get a, everywhere we go, we have private tours. The Hermitage in St. Petersburg, you've probably heard how crowded the Hermitage is. When there isn't a pandemic going on, it's body to body and you can't move, unless you're on a tour with Golden Eagle. 
And then you go in the morning before it's open to the public and the only people in the entire museum are our group. So we have culture in Russia. And of course we've got the Russian icons, St. Basil, Basil's on Red Square. The inside of just one of the many beautiful cathedrals you'll see along with the singing by the monks, again, often with a private concert while we're touring one of the cathedrals. And even the underground cathedrals of Moscow, this is one of Moscow's famous subway stations. They're unlike the subway in other parts of the world. So with that, let's talk about the Aurora. We will go looking for the Aurora. There's no guarantee that we're going to see it. It's, it's a gamble. That's why it's a quest for the Aurora. They are spectacular. It's a wonderful experience. And usually we get to see it, but you don't have a guarantee of that. Now, the Aurora is actually caused by mass ejections from the sun. And there's the sun as you and I know it. There's that glowing yellow orange ball in the sky. Now that may be not quite as you know it. I took that picture at midnight. This is off the Northern Cape of Norway, not far from where we go with the Golden Eagle in Kirkenes. Only this is Midsummer's Day, not Midwinter's Day and the sun never goes down, that's midnight. That's the sun as we know it when we glance up in the sky. This is a picture of the sun taken with a satellite called SOHO, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory. This picture is from this morning. I just downloaded this. So this is what the sun looks like today. And the sun goes through cycles. I'm going to talk to you about those. At the moment, the sun's at the low point of its cycles and there are no sunspots on it. We'll see it with the spots in just a moment. If you'd like to look up the SOHO website and look at these pictures of the sun, just put SOHO into your web browser, but be sure to put SOHO mission. If you only put Soho, at least if you're here in the UK, you will go to some very strange places in one of the neighborhoods of London. So remember Soho mission. When we look at the sun, we look in visible light. And so a little bit of science here. On the top, I have what's called the electromagnetic spectrum. Light that we can see with our eye ranges from purple to red, from short wavelength in the purple to long wavelength in the red, from high energy in the purple to low energy in the red. This is what we can see with our eye. But there are many other kinds of electromagnetic radiation. There's higher energy, shorter wavelength radiation, gamma rays, x-rays, which you'll know from hospitals, ultraviolet, which you'll know if you spend too long on the beach in the sun with sunburn. There's longer wavelength electromagnetic radiation, infrared, which you can feel as heat, and then microwaves, which you pick up with your mobile phone, and then radio, of course, television, you're used to communication with those. Now, you and I think of glass as being transparent, walls as being opaque, humans as being opaque. But if you think about it, if you go to the hospital, you have an x-ray. With x-rays, you can see right through the human body. You and I are transparent in x-rays. If you look in microwaves, well, the walls of your house are transparent to microwaves, and you know that because you can sit on your phone at home and get a signal and use your phone in your house because these waves will come right through your transparent walls. So this is just so that you know our view of the world, our very human seeing as believing, using optical light is just looking at a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And with the sun, we want to look at other parts where we can see much more detail. We're particularly going to be looking in the ultraviolet in a few minutes to see the spectacular outer part of the sun. We can only see visible light, but there are other animals that can see other wavelengths. These are pit vipers. Bottom one here is a North American rattlesnake. And they're not called pit vipers because they live in pits. They're called pit vipers because they have pits on their face. And here you can see them if you look at the arrows. Those pits are infrared eyes. These snakes can see in the infrared. Everything that is warm, everything that has a temperature above absolute zero glows with electromagnetic radiation. The sun is so hot, at 6,000 degrees Celsius, that it glows in the visible with its beautiful visible life that makes life possible here on the earth. You and I have got a temperature of 311 degrees absolute, 37 degrees Celsius, 98 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that temperature, we glow in the infrared. These snakes can see us by our own radiation. When I was a child growing up in California and I would go hiking in the hills at nighttime, those rattlesnakes could see me walking in the dark because I looked like a big light bulb shining by my own light. Now, rattlesnakes are afraid of humans. Snakes are, we humans are dangerous and they normally will try to stay away from us. 
But the little mice that they feed off of that run around in the dark are little light bulbs in the dark. And of course, the snake is using this infrared vision to see the body heat of its prey and catch its food. Well, you could look at me in the infrared. We've got cameras that work in the infrared, and this is what I look like in the infrared. We can't see infrared, so we have to make up colors. And in this particular case, we've made something called a lookup table where we've said, all right, if it's the cooler part of my face, we'll color it red or blue. And if it's the hotter part, we'll color it red. And so this gives you a temperature view of my face in the infrared. What I'm trying to tell you is there are other ways to see things. And we're going to look at the sun in ultraviolet, which we can't see with our eyes. But you're going to see how incredible the spectacle of the sun is when we look in ultraviolet light. So there's the sun again in the visible. Let's look at it in ultraviolet. This is from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Down in the lower corner of your picture there, it says SDO. That's the name of the satellite that's out there orbiting the sun, taking movies of it. The movie is greatly sped up. The sun takes 25 days to rotate at its equator. And so this movie is very much faster than that. There's a clock running down at the bottom that will give you some idea of the speed. And notice all the activity in the sun. Look at these loops of gas. Look at the material blasting and shining, gas stretching out above the part of the sun we can see with our eye. This is out into what we call the chromosphere and then the corona of the sun. And the sun has weather. It has incredible dynamic weather. It's got flares, mass ejections, and there are explosions, snapping magnetic fields, and it puts out incredible blasts. And when those blasts hit the Earth, we get pyrotechnics here, and we'll be looking at some of those effects. One of the main effects when a blast from the sun hits the Earth is the aurora, the thing that we go searching for with the Golden Eagle when we take the trip up to the Arctic Circle in the winter. So here's an artist's sketch of the sun, a cutaway of the sun. The sun is 330,000 times more massive than the Earth. It's 100 times greater in diameter than the Earth. This cutaway, if we look over here, this is the surface. And all these little yellow dots you see are called granules. Those are hot rising columns of gas where the energy created down here in the core, where the sun has a temperature of 15 million degrees. As it comes to the surface, it causes the outer 30% of the sun to boil with hot rising columns of gas and cool falling columns of gas. Now, in 1925, an English woman named Cecilia Payne completed her PhD at Harvard University in Massachusetts. And she wrote, which was probably the most important PhD ever written in astronomy. She showed that the sun is 90% made of the lightest gas hydrogen, 8% helium and only 2% heavier elements. The rest of the universe is the same. So the sun's primarily hydrogen, the lightest gas. And this gas out here is boiling and where it comes to the surface, the top of the columns are hot, they're brighter and you see them as spots. The cool gas around it makes these lanes as it falls back down again. And to give you a scale, that little spot I'm pointing at right there with my arrow is about the size of Texas. If you're from North America, uh, it's the length of the United Kingdom from John O'Groats to Land's End. Those spots are absolutely vast. These dark spots are called sunspots. We'll learn more about them. They're a real marker of activity on the sun and how much is happening, how likely we are to see the aurora. Out here in the outer part of the sun, the gas heats up to about 2 million degrees. This is called the corona. The only time you can ever see it for yourself is during a total solar eclipse. Uh, there was one of those a few days ago, but it was only an annular eclipse where the moon was a little too far away to completely block out the sun. Very exciting, but not enough to show the corona. Uh, the next really good eclipse that you'll be able to see the corona for, in fact, goes through North America, for those of you who are there now. It'll come up through Mexico in 2024 up through Texas and then up through the central states into New England and off the coast of uh, Newfoundland in 2024. So there's the sun as seen by an artist looking at the interior structure, which we astronomers understand extremely well. I want to show you an incredible blast from the sun. So here's a NASA movie. It's got a little music that NASA put in and I can't talk over that. So you know, I'm going to go silent for a moment and let's watch this incredible flare on the sun taken from the Solar Dynamics Observatory.
let me talk to you about what you were just looking at. You were looking at a flare on the limb of the sun. It would put out as much energy as we humans could generate in a million years with all of our power plants. And for the sun, that's just weather. It's a big hiccup. It's something that during part of its cycle of 11 years, it can do several times per day. At the present time, it does it several times per week. This is another movie of the outer part of the sun looking out into the corona, that hot, hot 2 million degree gas, and at some of the very active regions on the sun from a satellite looking in the ultraviolet. Now here's another picture, a different ultraviolet wavelength. We've given it a different color. And over here on the limb of the sun, there's about to be an explosive flare. Now, if you can see my cursor right there, the earth in size would be a little bit smaller than that cursor. That'll put it in perspective for you. Here comes the flare. or explosive prominence. That blasted about 2 billion tons of hydrogen off the surface of the sun, traveling out at a speed of about 2,000 kilometers per second. This movie is sped up, as was the movie you were watching with the music. Uh, that was sped up by about 360 times. One second equaled six minutes. So back to the sun in visible light. This is now the sun as we would see it with our eye or through a telescope with eye protection. And over here, you will see there's a huge sunspot group. These sunspots are places where a magnetic field reaches out through the surface of the sun, and it cools the gas to a mere 4,500 degrees Celsius. The surrounding gas at 6,000 degrees is brighter, so the sunspot looks dark in comparison. But I can assure you that if you were up close to that sunspot, it is intensely bright, just darker than the rest of the sun. And it's highly changeable. Here we'll watch a sped up movie of the sun rotating. Remember, it takes 25 days to rotate at its equator. And you'll see how the sunspot's changing with time as the gases in the sun churn and mix and pull the magnetic fields around. If we look deep into a sunspot with one of our telescopes like this, we can see the granules. Here they are, these hot rising columns about the size of Texas. The cool lanes around them, which fall back down again. And then from the sunspot, there's gas moving out of the sunspot. When I show you the movie, it's going to look like it's moving in, but that's a stroboscopic effect. It's the same effect you get in an old cowboy movie when the wagon comes into town and it looks like the wagon wheels go backwards. It's a, a beating between the rate of the number of frames you're taking per second and the actual motion in the atmosphere. But you can see the gas flows. You can see the churning of the gas coming up and going down in the sun. The sun's very active. We see none of this with our naked eye. And so what does that do? That, that produces the sun's solar cycle. It has an about 11 year cycle where the number of sunspots goes from nearly zero as it is today up to a very large number and then down again over 11 years. This plot on the top is a plot of the sun as a Mercator projection. So this is latitude. There's the North Pole. Here's the equator. There's the South Pole. And this is against time from 1870, 1900, right up almost to 2020 for this plot. And what you can see is that each of these little lines in here represents a sunspot group. At the beginning of the cycle, the sunspots appear about 30 degrees north and south latitude. As you saw in the movie I just showed you, the sunspots don't last forever. They typically have a life of a couple weeks and they disappear. New sunspots then appear. But over the 11 years, the sunspots drift when they appear down towards the equator in both hemispheres until at the end of the cycle, they're down near the equator. And just at the end of the cycle, all the sunspots disappear and they reappear back up at 30 degrees and a new cycle starts. The difference being that there are magnetic fields associated with these sunspots and the north and south poles of the magnetic fields flip every other cycle. On the bottom, Time's the same, but now we're plotting the number of sunspots. And you can see they go up and down on an 11 year cycle, but each cycle's different. This is the 1957 cycle when the sun was very active. The aurora were incredible back in my childhood in the 1950s. And the sun's a bit quieter today, but still active enough, we get to see plenty of aurora. Here's a plot of 400 years of sunspots on the sun. Starting in 1600, why 1600? Actually 1609, when Galileo first used a telescope to look at the sky and record sunspots. 
We do have sunspot records before 1600 for naked eye sunspots, primarily from Chinese records. But regular records of sunspots kept with telescopes started in 1609. And you can see the cycle here going up and down. But back here in the 1600s to 1700, the last half of the 17th century, the sunspots effectively quit. That's called the Maunder Minimum. And at least in Europe, it was very cold then. The Thames froze over in London. You could ice skate every winter on the canals in Amsterdam. And it was thought at one time that this might have been a cooler planet during the minimum. We now know that the weather changed, but the average for the planet was not changed. It was cooler in Europe. Um, the question has come up, could we possibly be going into another solar minimum like this, and could it help with climate change? And the answer to that is no, it can't help. It's up to us to help ourselves. So you can see the sunspot cycle changing here with an 11-year cycle, and we're at the bottom of one of those cycles right now as we head into the next one over the next couple of years. Sunspots have got magnetic fields, and I think for many of you, I hope even all of you, you did, as I did when I was a child, take a magnet, sit down in the sandbox, and drag the magnet around until you'd picked up a lot of iron filings, and then plop the iron filings down on a piece of paper and stick the magnet under it, and you can see the iron filings following the magnetic field lines. These are lines of magnetic force going from the North Pole to the South Pole back to the North Pole. So there on the Earth, we can actually make the lines of magnetic force visible. The gas in the sun does that because the gas gets trapped by the magnetic field. So here again is a cutaway of the sun. The sun rotates not as a solid body like the Earth. The sun's made only of gas. And at the equator, it takes 25 days to go around once. Up here at the poles, it takes 35 days, much slower. And inside the sun, the magnetic field of the sun, which is like a dipole, with the equator going around faster, the gas can latch onto the magnetic field and it stretches the magnetic field until it ties it up into what we call flux ropes. It, they're ropes of magnetic force underneath the surface of the sun. And then the hot rising columns of gas grab those magnetic ropes and pull them out through the surface as a loop like this. And we see the gas following the loop and the sunspots form right here at the base of the loop. When those magnetic loops touch each other, the magnetic fields snap. And this, is, this is like putting energy into a spring. You stretch it far enough and it snaps, you get a lot of energy released. Well, in the case of the sun, when these magnetic fields touch each other and they snap, and here's a nice beautiful picture of them, they can produce a flare. And as I said earlier, that can produce as much energy as we humans could generate with all of our power plants in a million years. This is the sun seen during a total eclipse of the sun. The moon is directly in front of the sun in this picture. It's blocking out the part of the sun that we normally see. And if you go to a total eclipse during totality, it's safe to look with your naked eye. You do not need eye protection during totality. And then the only time in your life during a total eclipse, you can see the corona. You can see the magnetic field reaching out here beyond the sun, guiding the wind that blows from the sun. Here's a huge prominence on the edge of the sun right there. And some of you will have already noticed, you can see the moon. There is, for those of you in the Northern Hemisphere, the man in the moon. For those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, the rabbit in the moon. They're the rabbit ears, for those of you who don't know it that way. Why can you see the moon if the sun's on the other side of it? And the answer is, the Earth is over here. We're on it. And from the moon's point of view, it's full Earth. And the Earth is incredibly bright. And so you're seeing the moon right here lit up by Earth shine. So there is, back to the SOHO website, there's the SOHO visible view of the sun. These are different wavelengths of ultraviolet light that let us look out farther and farther into the atmosphere. We can look at the magnetic field. And then there are two disks on the sun, on the sun, on the SOHO satellite, which block out the image of the sun, these little white rings, so that we can look at the corona of the sun from the satellite as we can only do from the ground when we go to an eclipse. This instrument's called LASCO. It's a coronagraph. And so I will explain this. It will repeat. This circle right here represents the sun as we would see it with our eye. In the telescope, there's a disk that's blocking out the light from the sun. This arm that you see right here is the arm holding up the disk. Of course, you've already noticed a comet comes through the picture. And the sun's boiling the comet and blowing the gas away. When the comet comes back again, you'll see a little line on the front of it. 
And that line's artificial. That's just um, overexposure in the camera. The, there isn't a line on the front of the comet. You can see the wind blowing from the sun. You can see blasts coming off of it. As the Earth orbits the sun, it's moving through the stars. And so from the point of view of the telescope, you're seeing the stars drift since we're holding the telescope on the sun. So those are the stars in the background. There's the wind that constantly blows from the sun. There's a coronal mass ejection right here. And if one of those hits the Earth, that's when we get really exciting pyrotechnics here in our geomagnetic field. So not to scale, here's the sun with its wind blowing out to the Earth. And the Earth has also a magnetic field. That's what you set a compass with. And the gas from the sun, which is primarily hydrogen, broken up into its component protons and electrons, which have electrical charge, those particles get trapped in the Earth's magnetic field. They spiral around the magnetic field lines. Here's a close-up view of the particles spiraling around the field lines because of the force between the magnetic field and the electrical charge on the particles. And that's happening right now. Those particles come down along the magnetic field lines to the Earth's magnetic pole here in the north, which is in northern Canada. It's not at the rotational pole. And where the magnetic field squeezes, it acts as a mirror and the particles bounce and they go back down to the southern hemisphere. They bounce at the southern hemisphere, they come back to the north. And the rate they do that right now is north, south, north, south, north, south, twice per second. They're moving at a very large fraction of the speed of light. They carry a tremendous amount of energy. And when they come down to this bounce point and ram into our atmosphere, they cause the atmosphere to glow. That's what produces the aurora. This is the auroral oval. I downloaded this aurora prediction um, from a website. I'll show you where the website is in just a moment. And so this is a constant prediction which is going, an aurora forecast. And there you can see your chance of seeing an aurora is this green light here. If it goes red, you're guaranteed. This bright green, you've got a very good chance. You'll notice that because the magnetic pole is in northern Canada here, the aurora comes down over Canada and right down almost to the U.S. border. But over here, in the European side and Russian side, the aurora oval, you have to go very far north to get under it. And there's northern Norway and Murmansk. That's why we go up there to see the aurora. You'll see that down here in the UK, for those of you who are in England watching this, um, it's too far south and we rarely see the aurora from here. When we do, it's just on our northern horizon. So when we're on the train, I'm watching this prediction all the time to have a good idea what's likely to be happening to us uh, at, on the night when we go out to look for the aurora. Of course, I tell you about it too, and many of you are watching it along with me. And if we're lucky, <laughs> it's a spectacle that's absolutely beautiful, and it's always moving, never constant. It ripples and it moves, the colors change. Sometimes it's so faint you can hardly see it. Sometimes it's so bright that you can just see incredible structure. And so there's somebody's beautiful picture of an aurora over a lake up in northern Norway. You can see the aurora from space. Here's a European Space Agency movie, sped up, taken by one of the astronauts on the space station. As you know, two astronauts just went up to the space station in the first successful manned launch from the US in 10 years, just last week, two weeks ago. And they get to look down on the aurora where it's slamming into the upper atmosphere. We look up to it from the ground. They look down to it. That thing coming into the picture right there is the solar panel that produces the energy for them. And so the cause for the aurora, these electrons come spiraling down into the Earth's atmosphere, high in the Earth's atmosphere, hundreds of kilometers up where it's almost space. Those particles can make oxygen glow with a red light. Now, when you get a bolt of lightning, the lightning causes the atmosphere to glow and you get this brilliant white flash that you see as lightning as the electrical charge moves through the atmosphere. In the case of the aurora, the individual electrons are bumping into atoms of oxygen and nitrogen. Those are the two main things our atmosphere is made out of. You're sitting there right now breathing 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% argon, a little bit of water vapor and a few other um, molecules such as carbon dioxide, primarily oxygen and nitrogen. And there you'll see lower down in the atmosphere, the nitrogen emits radiation, red light. Primarily we see the green aurora. Sometimes you'll get to see a red one. And so I downloaded this picture. This is the auroral prediction as of 
um, UK time, quarter past six. So this is a little bit over an hour ago. Let's see, we are right now on uh, 7.30. So I did this an hour and 15 minutes ago. There was the prediction for right now. It looks like the chance of seeing an aurora over here coming around to Norway is pretty good, but we don't go on the Golden Eagle luxury train to Norway at this time of the year to see the aurora. And I think you'll see the reason for that's obvious. It's daytime. <laughs> the sun doesn't go down this time of the year. You can't see the aurora when the sun's up. And so summer's not a chance. It's not because the aurora is not there. It's just, you have to have nighttime to see it. And of course there is an aurora in Antarctica too. There's the aurora australis. And this is the prediction again. This is an hour and 20 minutes ago that I downloaded this. And there's a good aurora going on off the coast of Antarctica right now where it is nighttime. But of course being Antarctica, there's nobody there to see it. Aurorae happen elsewhere in the solar system. This is the planet Saturn. And that's taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And there you can see Aurorae at the poles of Saturn. And so it's not only the Earth that has an aurora. Saturn does, Jupiter does, and probably planets elsewhere in the galaxy. Now, one of the things I will talk to you about when we're on the train is I'll talk to you about our discovery of more than 4,000 planets orbiting other stars, our search for planets like the Earth, where there's the possibility of life. I'm an astro seismologist. I do seismology of the stars. I'm a co-author of the fundamental textbook in that field. And that allows us to look inside the stars, to tell their ages, to characterize them, so that we can then know what the chances of life are for the planets we're discovering around these other stars. Those are stories that I will tell you while we're out looking at the aurora. We'll also look at the constellations, hear sky stories, names of stars, talk about the possibility of life elsewhere in the universe, find out about UFOs and why nobody's visiting, and what really happened in Roswell, New Mexico. There are many stories to tell you while we're on the train about the sky and about the stars while we search for the aurora. In March of 1989, there was a flare from the sun in what's called a geomagnetic storm. That's when the magnetic field in the earth, the magnetic field lines touch, they reconnect, and that dumps a tremendous load of those high energy electrons on the night side of the earth down into our atmosphere. As those come down, they produce incredible effects. That particular flare, there was a naked eye sunspot. I happened to be in northern KwaZulu-Natal at that time on the Mozambique border, uh, bird watching as it happens. Uh, my wife and I are very keen bird watchers. We got up early in the morning in thick fog and the sun was rising and with our naked eye we could just look at the sun because it was so dim and there was a sunspot so big you could just see it. You didn't need a binoculars, you didn't need a telescope. That sunspot is the spot which created this flare and that flare blasted the earth and the electrical currents from it shut down the entire power system of the province of Quebec in Canada. The aurorae were seen down to very low latitudes, right down into the continental US, down into um, main parts of Europe. I was in South Africa at the time. We could see the aurora at 30 degrees south from our observatory there. It blew out the power systems in Quebec. And here was an announcement put out by the Hydro-Quebec, their power company, who were getting so many complaints that all the power was down. And they said, well, all those motorists sitting at the traffic lights cursing should realize it's not Hydro-Quebec's fault. The sun did it. So the sun can blast our power systems. We are beginning to make them more hardened against these sorts of events. We're learning our lessons, but there are even bigger blasts possible from the sun. Here is from a scientific paper written in 1859, September the 1st, by Richard Carrington. He recorded in a hand-drawn picture of the sun. He was using eye protection through his telescope. He saw flare on the sun, which is this little white patch. We know it now as the Carrington event. It was the biggest blast from the sun in the last 500 years. There's the date and the time, Greenwich Mean Time. At that time, there were telegraphs and the currents that were generated in the telegraph wires caused the telegraphs to fail. The aurora was seen right down to the tropics. We call this an X-class flare and it had an energy of 10 to the 27 joules. Now that may not be a number you're so comfortable with. We astronomers like big numbers. That's 10 followed by 27 zeros. Joules are a unit of energy. And I'll put that in perspective for you. Here's a plot of human energy consumption. It's from 2015, it's gone up since then. 
Our major energy generation mechanism is oil. And of course, that's how we're changing the climate. That's a problem we've got to deal with. Our second most common energy source is coal and then nuclear renewable. Now these are changing, the renewables are coming up and hopefully we're doing something about that. But the total in 2015 was two times 10 followed by 20 zeros of joules per year, which means that this flare had 5 million times the energy that we humans can generate in a year here on the earth, or another way of putting it, as much energy as we would generate in 5 million years. We are really small stuff. What can those events do? Well, there will be another Carrington event. We say once in 500 years, but the potential damage today, it blasts satellites, it can knock out communication satellites, it can knock out GPS. Um, estimates are 30 to $70 billion loss of um, Earth orbiting satellites. Communication internet, internet disruption. We're improving on that. And many of you now, especially if you're, if you're on this watching from say North America, Europe, you're probably getting your internet now by fiber optics and the fiber optics are reasonably immune to a blast like this from the sun, but any wires are not. And that includes your computer and your power source for your computer. And so if this happens sometimes before this talk is over, all of our computers are going to burn out and the talk will end without me being able to tell you that. Um, hopefully not for another 500 years as we begin to build better protection for our technological infrastructure. Astronauts in space, between two of the Apollo missions in the 1970s, early 1970s, when astronauts went to the moon, between two of those missions, there was an X-class flare that blasted the Earth and the moon. If the astronauts had been between the Earth and the moon or on the moon at that time, they would have died instantly. They knew that there was that chance that could happen to them. They were very brave. The public in general wasn't told about that threat, thus to keep those sorts of dangers from the public. Astronauts are brave people and they'll take those chances for the adventure and the excitement of going to space. When we send astronauts back to the moon, perhaps in the next couple of decades, some country in the world will do that. Better protection is needed. For a trip to Mars, which will take two years to get there and come back again, we don't yet have the technology. We don't yet have the ability to protect the astronauts for two years against death from the sun. That's the big barrier, not just cost. That's the big barrier to a Mars mission and landing on Mars with humans. A great adventure that I hope humans will do someday, but it may be some time before we're ready for that, solving this problem of radiation from both the space and the sun. There's a 2014 picture of one of these X-class flares from the sun with major blast of the earth and beautiful aurorae. As a result of that, you do get the reward of beautiful aurorae if you happen to be there for that, but there are penalties to pay too. So if you would like to look up more information about this, and of course, when you come on the train, you'll be wanting to look at this particular website. This is the Space Weather Prediction Center of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States. They regularly monitor the weather from the sun. They're doing that for multiple reasons. They're doing it because industry needs to know. If you run power companies, if you run power lines across the planet, if you've got oil pipelines, which are electrical conductors, there are many things that a blast of the Earth and high energy in the Earth's Van Allen radiation belts can generate currents on the Earth and cause havoc here on the Earth. Industry wants warning that these things are coming. And by watching the sun, we can give about a 24 hour warning that a storm's coming. Right now, this is today. And in radio, storm from the sun, geomagnetic storms, no danger today. But that also means the chance of a really bright aurora is fairly low today too. There's a plot right there, which if you go to the website, you can blow up and you can then see the sunspot prediction for the coming cycle in the next few years as the activity on the sun climbs and we get more and more and more aurorae. I assure you, anytime you can see them, it doesn't matter when you go, our next trip this coming new year, um, of course, pandemic allowing, we will have the chance to see the aurora and there's a very good chance it will happen now. And those chances go up and up and up over the next coming years. You can also get these movies of the outer part of the sun, the wind with the LASCO instrument and the aurora prediction from this website if you would like to follow this further. So we have great expectations in search of the aurora borealis. It's the sun and the earth are connected in many more ways than just energy coming from the sun. 
And I hope you now have an appreciation of how the aurora happens um, that will only enhance the beauty of it when you get to see it with your eye. Thanks for your attention, ladies and gentlemen.